Welcome to the folks who are joining us today on uh, Supply Chain Insights webinar series. My name is Constance Coral, and I'm just going to do one quick sound check with my speakers. Karen Conway, can you uh, announce yourself? Yes, I can hear you. Great. And Philippe? Philippe Lombard, are you with us? Laura Sisiri. Good afternoon, Constance. Great. And Philippe, one more time. Okay. Well, let's try to get Philippe on board here. In the meantime, I'm here. welcome. Okay, great. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, welcome to the attendees coming in. We are going to be starting shortly. In the meantime, our Twitter hashtag today is SCI Webinar. Feel free to tweet out uh, nuggets of great information from today's webinar. That will come from our research report that was recently published and can be found on our website, supplychainsights.com. Again, we will be starting momentarily. Thanks so much for joining us. We will be starting in a couple minutes.
Well, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to today's Healthcare Value Chain webinar. I am your host for today, Constance Coral of Supply Chain Insights. In the next hour, you will hear from guest panelists Philippe Lombat, former Senior Vice President of Supply Chain at Merck, as well as Kraft Foods, and Karen Conway, Executive Director, Industry Relations at GHX, as they discuss the findings in the latest healthcare value chain research report. Our moderator today is Laura Sassiri, Founder and CEO of Supply Chain Insights, leading this, dis this discussion. Today's Twitter hashtag is SCI Webinar. We encourage you to share your thoughts and nuggets of information in the social networks. We also want to hear from you during the presentation. Please message your questions in the Q&A section addressed to panelists. We will compile them as we go on, and we will get to as many questions as we can at the end. At this time, I would like to welcome Laura Sassiri. Hey, thank you so much, Constance. And Thanks to our two panelists. I love talking to Philippe and Karen. Um, let's just get right into it. So when we look at the healthcare value chain versus other industries, what we see is that the suppliers in the healthcare value chain are some of the most profitable. And uh, if we look at the evolution of cash to cash and inventory turns, we see that the suppliers are not only profitable, but they also are holding about three times the level of inventory of some of the other manufacturers. So Philippe and Karen, I just want to start out with a dialogue of where do you think the suppliers are on understanding the supply chain as a system of finite trade-offs of cost cycles, complexity, and growth? Philippe, your thoughts here? Okay, so as you can see, I think thanks, thanks a lot, Laura. Um, um, the uh, the performance is quite different along the continuum. I, I I believe that food has had more challenges, especially in a in an industry which is not growing, and uh, they've had more possibilities to integrate across the supply chain from their own supplier all the way to the retail customer. And uh, that shows in terms of uh, the, the, the cost to cash improvement. Uh, they've also become much more global and uh, earlier uh, compared to other industry like the one uh, pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical, obviously, because of, I would say, a situation which was initially driven by high uh, new product, high level of new products, has been very successful in the past, but as it's becoming more and more difficult to deploy and develop new product, more expensive and much more fragmented, uh, you know, that has challenged the supply chain and to end of, of those pharmaceutical companies. And, and that shows in some of their not so great uh, performance improvements. So I would say on a scale of 1 to 10 for the company, the, the industry I know, food is probably a 7 and pharma is still at a, at a 3 to 4 right now. Great. And for folks that don't know Philippe as well as I do, which everyone should get to know Philippe, uh, Philippe, you tell the group a little bit about the work you did at Kraft and the work you did at Merck, just to give them some color. Right, so uh, at Kraft, I worked for Kraft for about uh, 21 years, and I started uh, back in Europe when the company was uh, a few hundred million dollars with a local company uh, that uh, in, in the past was then bought by Kraft. Kraft actually, all the way to 2011, was bought, was expanded through acquisition. You know, everybody in the U.S. here knows Kraft, but actually around the world, Kraft is actually one company only since uh, literally the, the, the mid-90s. And uh, what I worked a lot at Kraft was in various positions of procurement, manufacturing, strategy, and and at the end of the last 10 years was on a senior vice president of customer service and logistics where I did work to integrate all the, and harmonize all the different supply chain end-to-end, uh, -end, uh, gain scale, harmonize the different product portfolio, and also work in the last year a lot with customer. And then since two years, I actually moved to uh, Merck, where I was senior vice president of supply chain, where I did have uh, planning and logistics distribution responsibility globally. Uh, 
uh, and uh, that's obviously a, a very different uh, you know environment, albeit the same size in revenue. So it's fifty billion dollar for Merck and it's fifty billion dollar for Kraft before the split between Mondelez and Kraft Group. So when you speak about the difference in maturity, you speak from your heart and your right. experience, I've got, right? I've got the scars on my back to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Karen, let's shift the ball to you. Uh, first of all, tell the group a little bit about yourself, and I'm going to ask you the same question to talk about the understanding of the supply chain as a system for medical device and hospitals. Let's start. Tell right. the group a little bit about yourself. Certainly, and absolutely, it's, a, it's absolutely a passion of mine um, in talking about supply chain being a system, something that, quite frankly, hospitals and healthcare systems are only recognizing now. I have the opportunity, I work with a company called GHX, Global Healthcare Exchange. We're owned by 20 different companies uh, representing manufacturers, distributors, group purchasing organizations, hospitals, and healthcare systems and provide a technology platform where they can conduct a lot of their supply chain transactions, but just as importantly as the community, and really it comes down sometimes to just conversations between the selling side and the buying side, um, and starting to recognizing the opportunities not only to take costs out of healthcare, but also to get that visibility that we need to really drive change and understand how we can deliver value in healthcare. Uh, so that awesome. said, do you want to ask me the questions, or would you like me just to respond? So let's talk about uh, the medical device and hospital organizations. Where are they on the evolution of understanding supply chain as a system? Well, it's interesting, and if you look at the numbers that you have um, on the screen from your research, um, the, the medical device manufacturers here, these are all implantable device manufacturers. So these are the folks who are producing highly um, sophisticated products that are used in the OR and the cath lab. Interestingly enough, those are the areas of the hospital where the hospital supply chain folks have been the least involved historically. And one of the things that we um, encourage hospitals and healthcare systems to do is to talk to manufacturers, to learn about how they approach supply chain, because it's all relative. And while they may still be challenged, they understand the concepts around supply chain better than their customers. One of the things that's interesting is that the products brought into the OR and the cath lab are often hand-delivered by the vendor representative the day of the case, oftentimes with very little visibility by the hospital. There's absolutely very, um, um, there's a lot of challenges in terms of accuracy of actually capturing what did you actually use. There's additional information that has to be put into the EDI transaction around the lot and the serial numbers, information about the patient, the procedure, the physician. Sometimes that will delay the time from the procedure to when that PO is cut and from when that PO is cut until an invoice is released and the supplier is actually paid significantly long, and we've been working with a group of providers and suppliers to just by process improvement reduce that in half, and then adding technology that begins to speed that up and improve that accuracy. But if we look at this data and we think about how they are in terms of managing the supply chain as a system, Philippe said, you know, that food and beverage is at one level and pharmaceuticals at another. Where's medical device and where are the hospital providers? I would say, you know, it's we're still very much in a um, probably two or three, but where we have come, the rate of change and recognition, um, uh, I think you'll, acceler you'll see this accelerate. Um, hospitals are really looking at what they've perceived as their most profitable service lines for a long time, orthopedics, cardiovascular, spine, because it generates a lot of revenue, but they're starting to recognize that it generates a lot of cost, SG&A costs for the manufacturers in that area, extremely high, and this is a problem that only the two parties coming together, all of the players working together can solve. I think it's interesting that medical device, if we look at SG&A cost over revenue, uh, grew in the last decade 4%. And if we look at the percentage of SG&A cost for that particular industry, uh, the commercial teams, um, it's the highest uh, commercial. And so 
the redefinition, I think, of those relationships uh, is really important. And it's now, as we, Is it? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so as we look at the financial metrics, just to ground us, uh, we haven't made a lot of progress uh, across the value chain in terms of total inventory. What we've seen is that hospitals have shifted some of the cost of inventory, but we really have not been able to drive inventories down as a value chain or been able to reduce cash to cash, even though uh, you know we've been at supply chain management for 30 years. This is looking at the comparison of hospitals 2000 to 2003 versus hospitals 2008 to 2011, and you can see that we actually are starting to see some of the shift of inventory, but we're actually not reducing total inventory and this particular value chain has some of the most complexity in terms of bifurcated trade. So this is a medical device revenue management scenario where we've got the parties and we've got the multiple touch points in terms of chargebacks and rebates, which all introduces waste in the supply chain. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a recent study that we've done which was includes the views of 68 healthcare providers, some people would call them hospitals, 37 manufacturers, which were composed of both medical and surgical device and pharmaceutical, and look at where do people within the value chain see the current progress. So first off, Philippe, you know, when we look at this slide, uh, which looks at both the providers, some people call them hospitals. Overall, how successful is your organization's supply chain today in delivering on your goals? You know, what we see is the manufacturers do not feel that they're as successful as the hospital providers in terms of reaching their goals. What's your perspective on this? Well, I think the the world, Laura, from a, a manufacturer's perspective, is is way more complex than it used to be. Um, I, I think what what the manufacturers face is a lot of um, you know much more difficult, as I said, new product launch where the cost of developing the new product is much more expensive than it used to be. Uh, the rate of failure in phase three uh, of medicine is actually increasing. You know, up to about 10 years ago, Merck actually had never had a phase three failure of product. Everything always went through. Now, what the difficulty is as you try to replenish that, that innovation pipeline, and you're trying to deal with way more than the U.S. or, or Europe. You're trying to, to work with many countries in the world. That, that up, up front of that value chain is, is extremely challenging. On top mm -hmm. of that, um, the fact is that um, you, what you want is, is also be able to streamline. When you think about supply chain, you, you think about cost, you think about streamlining, you think about service. And, you know, at some point uh, we can talk about that. You think about inventory. But what I've seen is uh, in the case of, of Pfizer or, or BMS or, or Merck, uh, many of the company have made up for the growth, which was not there anymore in Western countries, uh, into a, an aggressive expansion in emerging markets. And what's really uh, very different is people always think as uh, emerging market as open, open uh, field and lots of opportunity. Yes, they are. But at the same time, it's a huge complexity of regulatory challenges. So I think what, what's out there is manufacturers are excited. You know, the, usually the manufacturing area has had a growth between 15 to 20 percent of top line growth in the last three to four years in, in emerging market. But that has come at the, the expense of much longer supply chain, very difficult go to market strategies. And, and most of all, a very complex regulatory environment. At, at this very moment, uh, you know, many companies like Merck have uh, up to 100,000 different regulatory product change at this very moment in their portfolio. So that drives a feeling within the supply chain organization that while you're making progress, the horizon keeps moving back to on you, which kind of drives those 27 to 30% negative here, I feel. 
And so it's the regulatory complexity, it's the ability to manage that global market, uh, the longer supply chains, and dealing with uh, phase three failures, you think, are the main components here? Yeah, I think that's kind of the, the you know, the, the challenge. At the same time, the, the challenge is also the cost uh, challenge is increasing because mm -hmm. while we ain't seen nothing yet in the U.S. in terms of healthcare um, cost challenge, Europe mm -hmm. has been in a, in a very, um, you know, deficit situation for a while. And uh, companies operating in Europe, for example, are faced with uh, government like U.K., France, or Germany that are certainly bombarding them with 20, 30 percent mandatory reduction with a six months horizon. So they they have a lot more difficulty to make up with that type of, of cost decrease. And that's why manufacturer right now, and you see that in your study, Laura, is have a lot of pressure to reduce the cost that frankly did not exist five to ten years ago. Okay. How about uh, the hospital providers and the medical device manufacturers? Karen, if you look at this, what do you see in terms of how well they rate themselves? Well, a few points. First of all, on the manufacturing side, while I think we will probably look at some of the differences between pharmaceutical and medical device as we discuss some of the other research findings, I have to agree with many of the issues that Philippe brought up. That's exactly what the uh, medical device manufacturers are facing in terms of their upstream supply chain. What's interesting why providers might rank themselves as more successful, um, it's uh, just a guess on my part, but I think an educated guess, that it's because their supply chain goals are, are, are fairly limited. They have been focused in historically on can we beat up the supplier on price? Can we get a lower mm -hmm. price? They look at product standardization. They look at utilization. So they're just now starting to look at the need to, to understand more of those products that they're being used, the cost to serve, the impact that has on total price, getting to, you know, they have pushed a lot of their problems, like inventory, onto manufacturers, which also, I think, speaks to maybe some of the other challenges as well. And they really need to, you know, a lot of the changes that the manufacturers have to make are going to be dependent in many cases on the sophistication and the recognition by the provider community. And it's coming that they have to work together to improve the operational excellence in the supply chain. Well, let's get into this. So when we look at where they feel good, uh, which is, you know, rating the performance of these two organizations, the hospital providers and the manufacturers. Philippe, we see that the manufacturers rate themselves pretty good on regulatory compliance, uh, focus on customer service, but I question here, Philippe, if we're really focused on the customer, if you know who the customer is, and recall management, but down lower are some of the tougher supply chain planning intensive kind of elements. How do you feel about this? Well, I, I think, again, from a top line point of view, I'd, I'd have to agree on the regulatory because that's in, in the business, in the pharmaceutical, if you're not following the, the compliance of regulatory, you're not in business. So mm -hmm. I kind of feel normal that this is number one. To your point, the number two of customer, the, 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 the elephant in the room is who is the customer? And mm -hmm. I think from a supply chain point of view, it's definitely not the hospital because uh, for the wrong reason, because the supply chain in pharma are effectively long. We actually don't interact in many instances directly with one another, so our supply mm -hmm. chain don't touch together. And so the customer satisfaction is very often in pharma, the McKesson of this world where you measure your own time in full. But at least it, it's good that, that it's there. But to your point, I think uh, this is an industry that has had to satisfy customer, not so much for the sake of customer satisfaction, but it's because the, the customer service is, a, is, a, is directly linked with missed sales, which in pharma manufacturer is linked with you know, a lot of revenue that you don't want to miss. Uh, combined right. with the patient impact, so it's an it's a it's a industry whose culture has been to have customer service at any cost, and which means that 
to your your question when you go into <clears throat> inventory fulfillment you know um, uh, how are they performance that's lower than their performance and and I frankly think it, it's 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 a, a bit overrated because I think it's it's an industry which is very similar with one another there is really no leader in supply chain in pharma manufacturers mm -hmm. so it's a lot of people looking at the same practice and I think to really change the the way things are being done in planning or fulfillment you, you really need to think out of the box of, of the industry mm -hmm. Yep, I couldn't agree more. Karen, now let's look at the hospital provider side and also the perspective of the medical device. What do you see here in these slides? I mean, it looks like the providers feel pretty good about inventory fulfillment, but I question if it's because their bar is a little lower in terms of both their understanding of supply chain and their goals. Thoughts? Well, a couple of things. Um, one, yes, we talked about before, I think, particularly with implantable devices, a lot of that has been pushed um, to the backs of the manufacturers, which leads to a lot of problems because you have lots of different inventory types. You've got hospital loans, you've got consignment, you've got trunk stock. I want to make a point or, or revisit a point that Philippe made about at what cost. I think um, in terms of inventory and fulfillment, providers would say, absolutely, we do a really good job at making sure the right product is in the right place. Um, at the right time, but again, at what cost? And then that just pushes upstream to the manufacturers being able to help them do that. We've got to look at a better way to do this. Uh, the other thing I think is important is to look at contract management. That came in a little mm -hmm. bit under the box. But if you think back to that very convoluted slide that you showed for revenue cycle, one of the mm -hmm. areas that people really need to address is the complexity around contract management. Manufacturers are holding GPO contracts, local contracts, facility-specific contracts, many of which are not used. The data is not necessarily good or timely or accurate. And you, you mentioned in your research about ERPs. That makes it extremely difficult and adds time and complexity to manufacturers in terms of managing those kinds of system upgrades. Yeah, I, I think there's a need for a whole redesign. And, you know, when we look at, you know, providers and manufacturers and, you know, their focus and the role of supply chain, you know, this speaks to me so clearly, you know. Karen, the hospital providers are about cost and, and then value-based outcomes and then inventory. But Philippe, you know, we've got kind of a different site here for manufacturers. So, Karen, what do you see here? Well, the thing that really um, stood out to me was not what's in the box, but what's not in the box. If you yes. look at increased visibility to products used in patient care, particularly, again, in the OR and cath lab, um, because it's so manual, we have not done a good job historically capturing data accurately at the point of care, um, which can cause all sorts of problems in terms of underbilling and even overbilling, as well as that demand signal. Increased visibility to product performance. How in the world are we going to balance um, you know, cost and quality if we can't make those connections? The good news is there are a lot of discussions happening in the industry right now about that. Question is if they're going to happen fast enough for the outcomes for what's going to be coming down the path, though, right? So I exactly. had one uh, hospital provider say, you know, we just can't have an evolution. We've really got to have a step change. Philippe, what do you see here in terms of what's in the box and what's not in the box? Well, I, I think again, it, it's it's I agree with Karen. It, it's about you know the customer service here is 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 number one, but uh, I think the customer service needs to be defined in in every in a much much broader way than than has been in the past, and operation more flexible to adapt to change in demand and supply. It, I think it, it's important, but you know, let's be honest. When you look at the the, the supply chain of the manufacturer, they are very underused supply chain. I think while everybody, as we said, everything is always urgent, there is a, a lot of uh, focus on service. But at the same time, when you look at the macro picture of the industry, it's an industry which has between 20 to 35 percent of capacity utilization in the manufacturing assets, which is extremely low. 
So I would say that the problem of flexibility is actually a, a problem of lead time uh, because the lead time uh, of, of uh, the manufacturers are way too high, which is also one of the things that drive inventory, and not because the, the demand is fluctuating, because every time there is a change, uh, things take way too long to, to, to have to, to change. And uh, I think, again, back to what Karen said, the visibility there, uh, it, it's usually something which uh, I don't think there is a lot of players that have a complete view of what be is becoming a more and more complex environment because historically uh, manufacturers have been outsourcing the distribution to um, the, the wholesaler, again like Makizan, that have had to deal with you know either uh, hospitals or even uh, physician, where the point of of care are effectively multiplying, and they're multiplying because people actually take their medicine or get their care not only at, in a hospital but also at home more and more, and and it's more and more that you know it used to be that patient used to have a handful of medicine, now in average, somebody who is more than 60 years old take in the U.S. an average of 25 pills or 25 medicine, and therefore you need to really think about what type of treatment and where are they uh, applied and where is the, 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 the medicine needed. And I, I don't think from a manufacturer's point of view it's very visible. And I think that visibility would make actually the point number two of, of what's really needed to be flexible and what's not much more uh, relevant right now. Yeah, but, you know, Philippe, one of the things that I see in the study is only one-third of manufacturers report that they've successfully integrated the supply chain and sales or commercial processes. And these are, you know, the manufacturers. And then only two in five of the manufacturers have a person really looking at the end-to-end -end supply chain. Why are these low? I mean, these are very low compared to other industries. Right, and I think in in the past, um, you know, we talked about rating of one to ten. I think manufacturers in the past, I mean, if you look at the supply chain or operation in total, uh, there used to be a very low importance within an overall manufacturer organization because the cost wasn't that big, uh, the product were always able to be delivered, um, and therefore the, the need to have a dialogue internally between sales and, and manufacturing was not that high. Now the trend and, and the need for a sales and operation planning and commercial talking to manufacturing is it's hugely important, number one. Number two, um, I think that that functional, uh, even within the supply chain in total, manufacturing, procurement, and logistics were very functionally and very siloed. Therefore, you don't really have a lot of horizontal management and integration end-to-end -end of the supply chain, which means that everybody that even when there is a dialogue with wholesaler or with hospital of somebody from a manufacturer who is not in sales or marketing, that person would have a very narrow view of what the supply chain in total would have. And I think that's been at Merck one of the, the key challenges we've had to really make sure that the people that had a contact with the customer knew why and when the, the issues and the challenges were going to be resolved and uh, had a full transparency internally to Merck because in the past, all they could say to their own customer was, we don't have the product and we'll get back to you at some point. So to your point, Laura, I think that integration of end-to-end -end, from supplier mm -hmm. all the way through manufacturer distribution, uh, it, it's not been there in the past because the, the, the talent has not been managed this way and neither has the organization been set up this way. But it's changing. And, you know, if we look at the changing of point of care and, you know, the evolution from the understanding of a sales-driven to more of a patient or a customer-driven organization, I think that's a real change management issue that's facing the, for the manufacturers. Karen, let's take the hospitals because I think, you know, from my point of view, I think we've got an interesting alignment issue also happening in the hospitals where the 
traditional evolution of healthcare, you know, the supplier sold to the doctor, and now we are still trying to figure out, you know, you know, what are we trying to do here? What's the role of the physician? What's the role of value chain analysis? Can you talk a little bit about alignment from the hospital or the provider? Absolutely, um, from a couple of perspectives. One, um, one in the same way that we've got um, kind of a gap internally in manufacturers between the supply chain business and the, the sales and marketing business, the commercial side of the business, you have a similar gap on the, in the hospitals and the healthcare systems, typically these silos between um, those responsible for the clinical side, the financial side of the business, the operations side, and then particularly when we're talking about implantable devices, you've got surgeons who are often independent contractors, and even with the trend towards more employed physicians, you will still see the orthopedic surgeons, the cardiovascular surgeons, the vast majority still staying outside of the hospital but looking at more shared risk. So you're seeing more of an effort to do some real value analysis and looking at both cost and quality. You've got to share data. You've got to speak each other's language. The other thing I mentioned early on in, the, um, in today's discussion was the fact that we'll, we'll suggest to hospitals and healthcare systems, talk to your suppliers, talk to their supply chain operations folks, learn from them. And unfortunately, we do find sometimes that when they try to initiate that conversation, the person they've normally talked to is from the commercial side of the business and has been reluctant to bring in the, the supply chain experts. Where we're seeing real change and where we're seeing costs go down, inventory go down, is when those walls come down and you have a broader discussion. You know, but, you know, hospitals are focused on value analysis, and when we look at the ability to have that broader discussion, Karen, you know, and we look at the importance versus performance, so the dark blue is what's important and the light blue is what's performance, right? You know, look at that gap between silos or the gap on product utilization and really the focus on cost. I mean, I don't think there's clarity about how they align. Thoughts? There's, you know, it's what's interesting is um, you see a lot of focus. Uh, I think I might have mentioned this on the more profitable service lines, um, orthopedics, cardiovascular, et cetera. Um, the focus has been more on how much are we paying who are we buying it from? Can we standardize more on products? Not saying that that's not important, but not necessarily looking at all of the other factors that are increasing costs and being able to share data and get better understanding. And this is going to get just more complicated, as you had mentioned before, about where care is delivered and as the definition of the customer changes from the physician to the hospital to the to the patient, quite frankly, who is also sharing a lot more of the financial risk as well and, of course, shares the quality risk. Yeah, and, you know, as we move from efficient sickness to health and wellness and the shift of that power, I just think it's this alignment issue in both the manufacturers and the hospital providers is so key around supply chain strategy. And you know, Philippe, when we look at the manufacturers and what they think is important in their current performance, and I listen to you talk about long supply chains, globalization, tax efficiency, uh, the need to improve cycle times and flexibility, low asset utilization, I look at the self-assessment on planning, and I just gasp. Uh, you know, the uh, light green is what's important, and the dark green is their current performance. The suppliers don't rate themselves very highly on their ability to plan. Does this surprise you? I mean, no, again, it's it's like we said before, it's about where you think you are versus, you know, sometime uh, a good import, importance on planning. Planning has been defined as tax, tax optimization, not not necessarily mm -hmm. as how do you optimize a supply chain for the lower cost delivery. So I, I think, again, um, what, what this shows is, at least for me, between the importance and, and the performance, the good thing is, 
I think they are raising the bar on themselves. They know that mm -hmm. you know it's important those uh, you know six six block here that you've circled, mm -hmm. and they know they need to get better and they need to improve their game, which is a good thing. Now I think that there is still you know the the the, the big watch out is the second one, which is manufacturing reliab reliability. There is a lot mm -hmm. of um, it's a very complex industry, but there's still a lot of blocking and tackling that needs to happen. And uh, you're not going to improve a lot of supply chain if your manufacturing reliability is, is not improved. So in a way, uh, what I'm a bit surprised when I look at that is the gap between demand planning and forecasting is as big as uh, the, the manufacturing reliability. I think that the, the importance of manufacturing reliability should, should clearly be, be much more important. And mm -hmm. the gap is actually bigger than what the manufacturers, uh, you know, rate themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the forecasting, it's a bit of a misnomer because, again, I'm sure, you know, the, 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 the people in the hospital business that are on the phone would say, yes, there is variation at a very small level, but I would, I would like to see some of the demand number coming from some hospital where I'm not so sure that uh, that uh, type of uh, variability is so high because it's self-created and the self-creation mm -hmm. is actually partially created by that lack of reliability. Uh, but to come back on, on the planning overall, there is a number one, be reliable. Number two, once the level of water decrease, you know, and you know where you should be flexible, then only then it makes sense to really start interacting with the the, uh, the outside world and improve your demand planning. One thing that I'd like also to bridge to what Karen said, and, and maybe there are some people on the phone here that have an opinion on that, is it's I think where it's been successful, and I've been part of interacting with in dialogue with uh, with hospital, has been a, a discussion on specifications which again does not happen enough because it is sometimes as simple as when you send me this type of product, why do you send me this type of packaging? Why is it in package of X when I need Y? And some of those dialogue can be actually very simply driven to conclusion and positive resolution, but those dialogue, to Karen's point, don't seem to happen. Because again, there is a over focus in some point of compliance of on the product spec as it's been defined on the manufacturer. So there is a religion about we are not going to change anything. And sometimes there is a feeling of the, the, the providers that, hey, we are not going to have a change anyway because manufacturers are too inflexible. So I think there is a big opportunity to drive cost and eliminate waste there that is not happening that I don't think is capturing any of those two pages. Yeah, and the other thing that I find interesting, Philippe, that I've learned from you, if I look over to the right-hand side, you know, what rated as offshoring to other countries to reduce cost structures, which a lot is taxation and uh, efficient tax of supply chains, that's rated higher than, you know, uh, um, performance than it is importance, right? But there's an awful lot of effort that's gone on in the pharmaceutical supply chain in that area. I I just thought it was stark contrast. Yeah, you know, no, I agree. And if there is one area when pharma and, uh, is, is way advanced compared to consumer good is actually in, in that area. There's been a lot of different uh, optimization of tax optimization. And, uh, you know, you look at the structural tax rate of the industry, it's actually fairly low. And that's why it's a lot of money there compared to costs. Um, but now those have been good and those are good to have for the performance of a company. But at the same time, if, if you only think about your supply chain about uh, from a tax optimization as opposed to a true physical customer, I think you lose the plot. And I think you don't even know who your, you know, who your supplier and your your customer are in your own supply chain. And I think this is something that that has to be not that tax is not important, but you have to bring the customer at the center, or the patient at the center of the the, the page here. You know, Laura, okay. if I can just add an anecdote on that. Um, what's interesting in kind of knowing who your customer or your supplier is. 
um, back during the Beijing Olympics, it was interesting. There was actually a glove shortage, a commodity product um, for a lot of hospitals. And what happened, it turned out that a lot of the suppliers had been outsourcing production of those gloves to a single manufacturing facility that was located on the outskirts of Beijing, and it was actually shut down during the Olympics because of pollution issues. Just very interesting to have that end-to-end -end visibility. Great. And when you look at this, and you know, you're also talking for the medical device manufacturers, what do you see here, Karen? Because I know when we first reviewed the slides with you, you were like, look at that demand planning and uh, supply planning gap. Your thoughts here now? Well, I think absolutely in terms of, you know, what was interesting is on one of the earlier slides, both the manufacturers and the providers both ranked themselves low on the demand planning and forecasting. Um, that is going to require, you know, better data capture, better sharing of data. Um, sometimes it's a technology issue, sometimes it's a process issue, sometimes it's a mindset issue. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of changes going on. The other one is the, um, the SGNA cost. And once again, I believe that that's a pretty significant gap. I'm surprised given how high SGNA costs are for in the healthcare uh, manufacturing space compared to other industries, that it's not ranked higher, but the gap mm -hmm. is significant, and this is one that absolutely depends on those conversations. And to Philippe's point, sometimes it literally is sitting across the table and going, I didn't know you needed that. I didn't know when you did that, this happened. Just a conversation, kind of mapping it out and understanding each other's world. Sounds simple but amazing results can come out of it. Yeah, and it, but it requires alignment. And, you know, Philippe, when I look at two-thirds of the manufacturers report the offshoring to reduce costs, right, uh, and regulation, taxation, uh, and talent are the top three changes that they're seeing to impact the organization. So, you know, it's really looking at which changes had the most impact on the organization in 2012. Um, you know, I don't think we're really working on the things that will help heal the value chain. I'm, I'm concerned here. Your thoughts? Well, I think, again, it's, it's about where the incentives are. And I, it depends. I, I don't know all the list of the manufacturers that have answered, but mm -hmm. I think if you have a company which is global in nature, I think that's exactly what 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 is uh, what is happening. What you have is, um, you know, again, companies that used to be present in 50 markets are now present in 150 markets, and suddenly mm -hmm. you you realize that, again, myself when I came into the pharma business, I I thought naively that you know the the regulation were much more aligned, but mm -hmm. sometimes regulation are so a way for some uh, countries to actually create trade barriers and mm -hmm. you know what China wants is not what Brazil wants which is different mm -hmm. from what Australia needs and and so I think from a supply chain point of view I think I feel it's normal that that number one come through uh, and also the right talent yes it's more difficult and it's also difficult when you think about it from a, a global point of view Again, mm -hmm. you may have availability of talent in the U.S. and in in, uh, in Europe, but when you start going going into you know Asia and, and Latin America, that is not that that obvious, and, and everybody's fighting for the same talent. Uh, but you're right. If you look at this from a provider point of view, you're like, what does it have to do with me? And because I think you need to go much lower, and I think what what you're getting into is uh, uh, again pharma as an industry used to be an organization where the team were extremely global, and, and in a way mm -hmm. they still are. But I think what provider needs is they need relevant solution at a country or or even obviously within the U.S. As a, as a, within a country level, which can be very different because the need of you know what somebody in New York or the population in New York needs is very different from Alabama, and right. and and so you have in a way what used to be one size fits all, that now from manufacturer what they see is geez, that the one size fits all is very difficult. And on top of it, I've got so many different customers that, frankly, I'm not equipped as a supply chain leader to drive. Because back to my earlier point, those supply chains organizations are functionally organized. They are not customer-facing organized. 
And that's a very big item, you know, customer facing for hospital, for large uh, organization. I think that's a trend that the manufacturer are going to have to adapt to. Yeah, I almost think about it. Go ahead, Karen. Go ahead. I was going to say, I was going to add one one good point, because we've talked a lot about challenges. When it comes to harmonization of regulation, one shining star um, I want to point out is unique device identification. Uh, the um, U.S. recently issued its final rule, which would require medical device manufacturers to assign and label their products with a unique code and then also provide data to a global UDI database. What's interesting is um, the U.S. FDA has worked very closely with its counterparts through the International Medical Device Regulatory Forum to really harmonize that regulation. And from speaking to the regulators around the world, I'm very optimistic that we will be able to get there, uh, which is really going to help us be able to capture more data on the products that are being used and have comparative data to get to population health. Uh, so there's a lot of good news there. Pharmaceutical track and trace a lot more challenging. I mean, even in the U.S., we've got 27 states that have issued their own e-pedigree rules. Hopefully, we will have um, federal regulation that will address that. We've got a lot of um, a lot of uh, advancement on the serialization side behind the four walls of the pharmaceutical manufacturers. But one of the things I think is important for us to have that that place, what you call an inter-enterprise system of record where we can be capturing data uh, on chain of custody and on events as those supplies move through the system. That's a good point. Well, let's wrap up. So the question is, how do we heal the healthcare value chain, right? We've got high profit margins for the suppliers, which are being attacked. Uh, we've got a shift in power to the patient, which is being asked to pay for more of the cost. We have the evolution of supply chain processes, where all parties are really weak at planning. Um, and when we were talking yesterday, uh, the two of you said that capability and mindset, you think, are our biggest challenges, along with the focus end to end, and that Costs haven't mattered as much as in the past to, to the suppliers, and it does now. And we got to focus on balance and building potential. So, Karen, what are your thoughts here? And what's your well, advice? Well, first of all, one more point on that slide you had before. Um, I was also surprised by it came, it fell out of the box, which was um, changes to impact organizations, manufacturers' view. They only ranked changes in government reimbursement at 27 percent, um, I think that will be significantly higher because that's where the real cost pressures that are going to drive things are going to change. Um, as Philippe also said in our conversation yesterday, you know, you don't have an impetus to change when times are good. Um, this uh, times are very, very tough. Um, there's only so much money that a society can spend on health care, and we have to share that um, across the supply chain, across the organizations involved in supply chain and in delivering health. So I think there is that mindset. I think it's absolutely critical. And, and the biggest area I see a, a challenge is in data sharing. Um, we actually got a lot of data. We could get better, could better the accuracy. I've talked a lot about that. But um, if you just even think about hospitals and doctors and studies out there in terms of would they even be willing to share, do they want to share information in an electronic health record with the patient for whom that record belongs? They don't. And we don't like to share information between various parties. I think a lot of the distrust between suppliers and providers comes from, it, it, you know, you don't share information. You don't share information. You don't trust. It's this vicious cycle that we get into. Um, I think we can bring in those capabilities. Providers will be particularly challenged. They've never really been able to financially attract supply chain talent because it's not where they have focused and seen it as a strategic asset. That has to change. But as you talk about in a lot of your research, um, the fight for talent is going to be very, very difficult. Um, but it actually, um, I think it really can change healthcare, it can change the world. Philippe, wrap it up for us. How do we heal the healthcare value chain? 
Well, I think it's continuing to be focused together on the patient, um, and, and I think it's it's uh, that's what's that's why we're all there in this healthcare industry. And I think to Karen's point, I do agree. There is an enormous amount of of data and information where if people were to collaborate with one another within the company and between the company, there is an enormous amount of, of uh, value that could be unlocked. So while we've talked about a lot of challenges, I, I think there is a, a, an enormous potential there, but we need to think out of, out of our box and we need to really work together to make trade-offs. And right now, we've sub-optimized as healthcare and so I think the end-to-end -end view and the end-to-end -end capability and talent management are going to be key. And with that, we're going to have to adapt our incentives as well. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us and helping us with this study. Uh, it is available as well as the slides are available for anyone to use. We publish in front of the firewall. Uh, Constance, do we have any questions? Uh, I don't have any questions at this time, um, but we will keep the Q&A section open for a little bit. Uh, okay. Do you have a couple of slides to share with the folks today? Great. This is just part of our ongoing webinar series. We do monthly webinars. Uh, our next webinar is in January. It's on uh, digital manufacturing, additive uh, manufacturing. Uh, the interface between uh, Internet of Things and mobility and 3D printing and looking at how does manufacturing have the opportunity to change in the future. We also will be publishing our Voice of the Supply Chain results, which really look at importance versus satisfaction of supply chain leaders on current supply chain technologies and the future of technologies. We have a webinar in risk management and dis digital path to purchase, which uh, both of them are great topics around the evolution of supply chain. Now, all of our past webinars are available on demand. We did a couple of webinars on metrics that matter. We're sitting on a database of 20 years of supply chain financial ratios, which allows people to really look at patterns at the intersection of profitability and cycles, either inventory or cost to co cash to cash or uh, working capital and uh, complexity, uh, things like revenue per employee. And we continue to mine that data, and we're working on uh, the correlation of the financial ratios to market capitalization. And we also have uh, what I thought was a great webinar that's archived on supply chain talent. We talked a little bit about that today. These can be found on our website. They can also be found in our community. And we're doing public training uh, you know, every couple of months. Our next one is in Atlanta, Georgia. If anybody wants to uh, really jumpstart their learning based on the research, share stories, or send high-performance team members to the training, uh, we're trying to boil it all down, distill it, share stories, and help people to jumpstart their learning. And financial benchmarking, of course, is available if companies need that as well. And we're building for our Global Supply Chain Summit for next year. It's September 10th and 11th at the Phoenician in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's designed for 220 supply chain leaders, uh, limited to 15% technology providers and consultants, very high-level targeted content that is around Imagine the Supply Chain of the Future. It'll have a learning lab, which really allows us to look at social applications, collaborative economy, mobility. Uh, we're inviting people to come and showcase manless applications for trucks and cars and think about uh, the next generation of logistics, as well as the ability to look at digital manufacturing and new forms of analytics. So a uh, learning lab, a good place to share, great case studies, people to look for our global summit next year. And you know, our writing, uh, we continue to share our writing in front of the firewall. If anybody has any questions, this is how you can connect with me. I love connecting with readers. And with that, Constance, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Laura, thank you so much for today's Healthcare Value Chain webinar. And I want to thank the panelists, Karen Conway and Philippe Lombard as well. Thank you so much for participating. Really great information. And you can 
view this webinar on demand. This has been recorded and we will be uh, sharing this on our website, supplychainsights.com, as early as tomorrow afternoon. And uh, you can share this with your network. As Laura said, our next webinar is in January, January 23rd on digital manufacturing. I hope to see you then. And then until then, uh, we have podcasts on our website. Please uh, check them out, Straight Talk with Supply Chain Insights. And we also have a couple of things coming up for the holiday season. So please stay tuned and uh, subscribe to our newsletter when you get a chance on our website as well. Until then, have a great day and we'll see you soon. <laughs>